Thank you, Chancel Choir. How beautifully you render that song. Good morning, beloved. And welcome to Green Hills Christian Fellowship. This morning, we have our Communion Sunday series, The One Who Creates Miracles from the Mundane, from the Ordinary. And we are going through the book of John, as you probably know, every first Sunday only. And this morning, I'd like you to realize, before we even start, that the Jesus we are looking at in this passage and onwards is a Jesus who loved to be with people. He loved to be with people like you and me at the best and most festive occasions of their life. And in fact, sometimes you will see that Jesus would separate himself from people for a short time so he could pray. And then he'd go right back to where the people were. He surrounded himself with them, you know them, the 12 apostles. And in this case, in our story, we see him in the middle of a wedding. Now, I know you've all been in a wedding, either your own or someone else's. And you know that every wedding always is memorable for one reason or another. Now, sometimes what makes it memorable are the things that went wrong. When I do a wedding, I tell the excited young couple, I want you to relax. I want you to know that there is no such thing as a perfect wedding. In fact, a perfect wedding without any glitches is boring. And I don't know if it makes them relax or it makes them more nervous. <laughs> but the truth is, minor glitches make it more memorable. I hope you don't have big glitches. One of them happened in our story this morning. I remember when I was a new pastor at GCF South Metro. Uh, you know, I was sitting among you for most of my life. For many, many years, the Lord called me, and the first thing you did as a church is to send me away to South Metro against my wishes. I'm just kidding, but that happened. So I was there, I think in my first year as a pastor, uh, I did a wedding for a couple who said, Pastor, let's do it in Intramuros, in one of those nice restaurants there. I think we held it early afternoon. So we did. Now, you brides, you know that during the night before a wedding, it's hard to sleep, isn't it? I mean, tomorrow, you, everyone will be looking at you. And sometimes it's hard to eat. No exception for this bride. And so when we started the wedding, she not only lacked sleep, she was hypoglycemic. And so while the groom was about to take his vows, I was looking at the bride, because I always see, want to see how they react, I saw her roll her eyes up backward and faint in the middle of the wedding. <laughs> Remember, I was a new pastor. I didn't know what to do. I was flustered. And then I said, the only thing I could say at that time, when the groom caught her, I'm glad he was the one, not me. <laughs> when the groom caught her, I just said, top of my mind, in the same way, friends, he'll always be there for her when she falls. <laughs> the only thing I could say, I'm glad it seemed appropriate. But weddings are always surprises, and this one didn't have a good one. They ran out of wine. It was an emergency. But in this first miracle that Jesus would ever do, you will see how small we are. You'll see that. You'll see how immense Jesus is. God the Son, all-sufficient. You will see why God does what he does. But let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for the story we're going to look at today. Thank you that every word captured here is true. Thank you that everything we have put our faith in is true. Thank you for the truth of the Son of God coming among us, dwelling among us, enjoying time with us when he walked on earth, as we will see today. Help us realize he still does miracles today, for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look at verses 1 to 5, please, of John chapter 2? Because you see here the crisis at Cana. You see here the limits of man. You see here how small we really are. So how does it happen? Well, the context of the crisis is a celebration. And you know this, when you attend a wedding, the pastor will always say, in the same way that Jesus honored a wedding, it shows God values marriage. That's very true. God the Son showing up at the wedding means 
God values marriage. And in case you starry-eyed young people are thinking your wedding has to become a big, audacious affair, you, t- you can take something from here, beloved. God is showing you today that even for a wedding that struggled financially, God joins us, is with us in our celebrations. God wants to celebrate with you and me. That's what you see here. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who was executed by Adolf Hitler, wrote before he died. He said, I don't want the God of the gaps, the God who only helps me in my crisis. I want the God able to be at the center of town, the God of my joys, the God of my fulfillment. Not just the God I call on when everything else fails, but the God who comes to the center of my life in my celebrations as well. This is the God you will see today in the wedding at Cana. The God who reveals himself to us in our celebrations. Let's look at the story. Verses 1 to 3 talks about Mary's plea for intervention. Weddings were very important events, then and now. But in this case, it was a very important one because in their time, when you ran out of wine, it wasn't just a social crisis. It was potentially a legal issue. The bride's family could sue the groom for social embarrassment, and receive payment. Now, this was a big issue. Why? The groom, just like Filipino weddings, was responsible for the expenses. Now, I know it's different in the Western world. They're more like Filipino here. The groom spends for most of it. Uh, and the way that Mary would be behaving here shows the traditional view that there's a story going on that it was the sister of Mary the children of one of Mary's sisters was the one getting wed here. And so, we see here Mary coming to Jesus Christ. Because this is most likely her relative getting wed. She's trying to avert a social and legal problem. So, comes to Jesus. Why? Expecting a miracle? We don't know. It's not clear here. You can say she's not. You can say she is. You'd be right. We don't know. But at the very least, she turned to Christ because she relied on him as the firstborn son of a widow. You must realize by this time, Joseph was already most likely dead. And who does a widow turn to? Most likely her firstborn son. She had gotten used to doing it. And so she pleads with Jesus. Jesus, they have no more wine. And let's look at verses 4 to 5 for her humble realization. Look at the way Jesus responds to her. First statement, dear woman, is that disrespectful? No. Jesus is not, not disrespecting his mother. It is very respectful, but it's not intimate. It goes like this. Few young people will go to your mother today and say, mom, I need my allowance today. But if you, you might get your allowance. But if you address her, dear woman, I want my allowance today. (laughs) I promise you, no allowance today. (laughs) That's the equivalent here. Respectful but not intimate. What is Jesus trying to do? Consistent with the rest of Scripture after this, Jesus would be trying to establish distance between him and Mary. For example, Matthew. 12, 47 to 50. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. They want to speak to you. He replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is not callousness. Remember, in John 19, when Jesus was crucified, one of his words on the cross was, woman, Mary, Behold, your new son, the Apostle John. John, behold your new mother. John, take care of my mother. Please make sure she's taken care of. And the Bible says from that time on, John took her into his home. Jesus loved Mary. He respected Mary. 
But he is trying to tell you and me today, and I hope you're listening, beloved, that even Mary needed to see him as the Son of God, as the Messiah, that even she needed the Savior. Remember when she was pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember her famous declaration we call the Song of Mary? She said, My spirit rejoices in God, my what? My Savior. Beloved, perfect people do not need a Savior. Only sinners. That's Mary. And this is Jesus telling her, Things are changing from this point on, my beloved mother. And look at the rest of his response. Why do you involve me? You know, when you translate that literally from the Greek, it's very clear that it's a gentle but very, very clear rebuke. If you translate it literally from the Greek, it says, What do you and I have in common about this? In contemporary language, so that we understand. Forget about the Greek. Mary goes to Jesus. Jesus. We have a problem. The response of Jesus is, what do you mean, we? That's what his answer is. Why do you involve me? So it's like the old story about the lone ranger and his faithful Indian companion named Tonto. Now, Tonto here is English, uh, not Ilongo. Okay. Uh, remember? Uh, the lone ranger and Tonto were walking along one day, when they found themselves surrounded by a thousand angry, fully armed Indians. So the Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and said, Tonto, we are in trouble. Tonto looks back at him and says, What do you mean we, Mr. White Man? <laughs> so, it's the same here. It's an analogy. Jesus is saying, this is nothing that I should be involved in. It's gentle, but it's clear. It's a rebuke. And in fact, he explains himself by saying, my time has not yet come. It's like saying, there is an hour, literally in the Greek, it's an hour, where I will be glorified. That's his death and resurrection. That's the time. I'm not going to be glorified today. You know, he did that. Very few knew about this miracle. Only the servants and his disciples. So Mary I'm not going to do something spectacular today because my time to be glorified is not at this social crisis. But he did help her. Now, to our youth, please don't try this at home. Huh? Please do not tell your mother when she says, clean up your room. Dear woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> my time has not yet come. Uh, do not say when she says, you make up your bed. Dear woman, my time has not yet come. <laughs> if you say this, I promise you, your time of death will come sooner than you think. <laughs> you cannot do this, please. This is not an example to the youth to disrespect your mother. If your name is the Son of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you can say these things. And besides, he was not disrespecting her. He was teaching her. He was instructing her lovingly but clearly and putting her in her place. Look at her response, beloved. Her response in verse 5 is commendable. She tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. What does it say? She accepts it. It's a very gentle but clear rebuke. She accepts it. She accepted the rebuke and then she shows genuine faith by telling them, do whatever he tells you goes like this. In verse 3, Mary approached Jesus as mother, and she is rebuked. In verse 5, she responds to the rebuke as a believer, and her faith is honored with the miracle. The miracle here is a response to that faith. That's why, beloved, 1 Timothy 2.5 is true. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Where did you get that? It goes like this. If you approach a third party, and, and the only thing the third party can tell you is, do whatever he tells you. Isn't it logical that you might as well go straight to the person? Do you follow that, beloved? 
And I mean no disrespect here because Jesus meant no dis disrespect to Mary. But I hope you see the logic here or even the common sense. If the only thing any third party besides Christ can say is, do whatever he tells you. Why not go directly to Jesus all the time? So this is the crisis at Cana. Let's look at the creation at Cana in verses 6 to 10, which shows the power and compassion of Christ. The first thing Jesus does is to turn water for washing into wine. The account tells us there were six jars holding about 20 to 30 gallons. These are big jars to hold 20 to 30 gallons each. You couldn't lift them. They were used for ceremonial washing. Now, apparently, even the water here was depleted. Why? Because weddings in Jewish culture could last for seven days. No wonder they ran out of wine. Seven days. So maybe this was the fifth, sixth, or seventh day already. Even the water for washing the hands of Jews, as required by Judaistic legalism, they ran out of it. So, Jesus tells the servants, uh, I want you to fill the jars with water. It says there in your Bibles, in any translation, they fill them to the brim. Is that significant? It's very significant. You see, if Jesus was a huckster, a swindler, you know, if I was a swindler, what I would do, I'll tell the servant, you fill it halfway. Halfway. Because the Jews had something like what you call wine paste. What they do is they will boil wine until it becomes paste. If you throw it into water, it becomes very dilute wine. If I was a swindler and a huckster who wanted to deceive people into thinking I was a miracle man, I'll tell the servant, you fill it halfway, okay? And then when no one is looking, I'll pour the wine paste there and shake the jar. But it says here, fill them to the brim. No room for swindling here. And what happens? As they filled them to the brim, he told them in verse 8, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Today, you would call that the head of the catering. I'd like you to understand how difficult this was for the servants. Remember, the water is for washing. It's for washing hands. It's not for drinking. It's like this. If you come to my home and then... Uh, uh, I ask you, are you thirsty? You say, yes, I'm very thirsty. It's very hot today. It's 40 degrees in the Philippines. Okay, you, I'll give you water. I go to my bathtub filled with water. I take a glass and then I give it to you. Will you drink it? Of course you won't. It's good for washing, not for drinking. That's the water here. And so the servants had to be very obedient to take it out and give it to the head of the catering. It says in verse 9, they did so. And the head of the catering tested the water, turned to wine. He called the groom aside and said, you know, you violated a local custom here. Normally, normally, you, you bring out the best first. And then when the people have gotten their fill of the best wine, you bring out the cheap wine. But you, you naughty guy, you brought the best wine last. You saved it for last. Is that true? That was a misconception. This was Chateau Lacaina, vintage AD 33. Jesus had created the wine. This was creation, beloved. I don't know when or how. Either it was when they filled it to the brim, it became wine, or while they were taking it to the head of the banquet, to the, man, to the head of the catering, it became wine. But somewhere along the way, Jesus created Wine from water. Why do I emphasize creation? You see, this glass of water, if I place it on my table for one year, even though all the processes of nature are accelerated, it will never become wine. For one, after one year, it might become a swimming pool for baby mosquitoes, but not wine. So Jesus did not accelerate a natural process. He created it all over again. This is John 1, 1 to 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who is this Him? John 1, 14, the Word became flesh. Jesus, 
the creator of this universe created wine again. And my invented title for it would tell you that this was probably the best wine in the history of mankind. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the most expensive bottle of wine in history was sold in 2010 at an auction. A bottle of 1947 French Cheval Blanc. It was sold for $304,375. It is so expensive that if you bought that, you would swear it tastes like $1,000 per drop. Because it is. Now, I would put that wine besides the wine that Jesus invented, Chateau La Cana Vintage AD33. It would taste very cheap. Because the created wine will be better than anything man can do. Our Lord can take water only good for washing and turn it into the best wine in history. He is able to take fallible men like Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and turn them into apostles. He is able to take weak and foolish things of this world. People like me and you. Turn us into trophies of His grace. That's our Savior, beloved. Now, some have suggested to me, Pastor, will you use this as an opportunity to comment on how should a Christian view alcohol? This is aside. That's why we call it excursus. It's just a more difficult spelling for aside. Okay, excursus is how should a Christian view alcohol? First thing you must know is that the alcohol in biblical times was diluted between one-third to one-tenth of the normal wine. Uh, normal wine, without any modification, is 12 to 14 percent alcohol. When you dilute it to 10 percent, it's 1.2 to 1.4 percent alcohol. Beer, our famous beer here, I will not mention the name, unless you think I'm promoting it, is about 4.5 percent. So it was almost physically impossible to get drunk on the wine in those days unless you were drinking for five to seven days. That's all you did. Very hard to get drunk. You can. There is alcohol. But what are guidelines, Pastor, for the gray areas of life? I will not prescribe to you today. Let's be clear on this. I will not prescribe. I will tell you the biblical principles you decide. According to 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33, and I adopted this from a commentary of Dr. John MacArthur on the same book, here are five guidelines for the gray areas of life. I choose to edify others rather than gratify myself. Before I take this cup, for example, it's wine or hard drink, I need to ask myself, is this because I want to edify others or is it because I want to gratify myself? Number two, before I take this cup, is it because I seek the good of others over my own or is it because I seek my own good? Number three, before I take this cup or glass, am I doing it because I'm willing to give up my freedom, that's called condescension, rather than be condemned? I'm free to drink anything I want. Hard, soft drinks. Uh, hard or soft drink, whatever. I'm free. There's no clear restriction. But if by doing it, I'll be condemned by other people with a weaker conscience, I will voluntarily give that up. That's called condescension rather than be condemned. Number four, I choose the glory of God over meeting my own needs according to 1 Corinthians 10.31. Before I take this glass, am I doing this because I want to glorify God? That's the famous verse, by the way. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, you do it for the glory of God. So am I doing this because I want to glorify God? And fifth and last, before I take this glass or cup, am I doing it to save others rather than making them stumble? So these are guidelines for the gray areas of life. You can use them in any situation. Not just drinking alcohol, uh, smoking, uh, how much Facebook is evil or sinful, uh, internet use, 
movies to watch. Do I only watch G or PG or what, whatever all the other alphabets are? Uh, you use this. Guideline for the gray areas of life. You decide. I am sure as I was reading it, you could already decide for yourself about alcohol. But I'd rather you decide that, even though it's already clear. Number two, under the creation at Cana, we see that Jesus turns obedient servants into participants of a miracle. You see how obedient the servants were. And they were rewarded with being part of a wonderful demonstration of creation. Beloved, God always provides for every person. But especially for a Christian, he will still ask you to do your part. He will not often do something unless you follow first. That's why we said you follow first. You do the simple, small, and unspectacular, and then you see the glory of God. You as a servant will bring water for washing. You have no idea what Jesus would do with it. You just bring it, that's all. You're a boy with five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus takes it from you. You have to voluntarily give it. And you do. You're wondering, that's a light lunch for me. How can it feed these thousands of people? But Jesus asked you to do it. You do the simple. You do the small. You do the unspectacular. And then you see God's glory. The problem with us is we reverse it. We ask God to prove himself, Lord, Lord, you do me a miracle, okay? Then I believe you. That's not how it goes. You do the simple, the small, the unspectacular, the miracle follows. We need to stop asking God, you need to prove yourself to me. Because that's not how it goes. That's the way that you see it here. Now, how does the miracle of turning water into wine relate to us today? In the Old Testament, beloved, wine represents joy, celebration. Jesus took what was unfit to drink, ceremonial washing water, which represented the Old Covenant with all its tedious requirements. And then he transformed it into the wine of the New Covenant, which is faith in Christ brings joy. Represented by the wine. And there are some of us today who have no joy in our lives. There could be two reasons. The first is you have never come to Christ personally and directly. You have thought that I need to go to some mediators. I mean, will, will God listen to me? Just me? Did you get what we just looked at earlier? Why go through any third party if all the third party can say is do whatever he tells you? You've never come to Jesus Christ yourself because you say, I need to go through other mediators or I need to help God. I hope if you're really listening today, you will say, it's very clear. I don't need any other mediator. I don't need to do more good works. I will just acknowledge I'm a sinner. And then I will turn to Jesus Christ personally, directly, and plead Him to save me. I promise you, on the authority of God's Word, He will save you. The second reason, especially if you're a Christian, that you may have lost your joy, is that something or someone has drained you of joy. I don't know what it is. Maybe somebody broke their marital vows. Maybe somebody swindled you out of the family inheritance. Of all people, a relative. Maybe your business partner has cheated you and you're about to lose all your life savings. I don't know what it is. But even as a Christian, you've lost your joy. What do you do? You do exactly what Mary said. First, you go directly to Jesus Christ. And then you do whatever he tells you. Did you get that? Go to Jesus Christ directly. And then do 
whatever he tells you. He may be telling you, you need to forgive your husband or wife again. You've got to give this marriage a chance again. And forgive rather than seeking a way out. If that's what Christ is telling you, then do it. Maybe Christ is telling you, you need to give up this business. You've been cheated already. You're trying to recover your losses or trying to sue and recover. And maybe you need to give it up. Start all over. Maybe Jesus is telling you to do this and to do that. But will you do what Mary said, please? You do whatever he tells you. And then the joy will come again. I hope you will realize that because Christ can do the same miracle in my life and your life again. There's a story about a young man who went to a costume party. He dressed as a priest, head to toe. He looked like a priest, but he was not. He's fake. Now, coming from the costume party, he didn't want to be cheated from the good stuff. So he took home a bottle of wine, and then he poured the whole thing into his water jug. So imagine him driving home, drinking from his water jug, and very soon, he was drunk. So his car was weaving left and right, left and right. A policeman stopped him, and when he looked inside, he thought it was a genuine priest. So he asked him, "Uh, Father, is there something wrong with your car? Because it seems to be weaving left and right. Uh, And then... When the policeman looks closer, he sees the red face, he smells the alcohol, and then he says, "Uh, Father, is it okay if I just smell that water jug of yours? What does it contain? Oh, it's nothing but water. Oh, yeah, really? Can I just smell it? And so, reluctantly, the pretending priest gives it to the policeman. The policeman smells it and says, This is not water. This is wine. And then the pretending priest clasps his hand in prayer, looks up to heaven and says, He did it again. (laughs) Please do not do this when you get caught. Because many policemen go to this church. (laughs) But here's what it means for us, beloved. Has the wine in your life run out? Remember, This Jesus of Cana, this Jesus of Cana, he can do it again. And he can do it again and again and again. You just have to go to him. And then if he tells you to do anything, it might not seem spectacular. It might not seem great, but do it anyway. And then watch him do what only God can do. And the conclusion at Cana is the outcome of everything. You see here in verse 11, beloved, the purpose of miracles. Verse 11 says, This first of his miraculous signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith. In him. What are miracles for? How do you evaluate those who claim they can turn it on and off? The power of God, like a faucet today. I mean, from time to time, they ride into Manila, don't they? Uh, They'll be announced in posters or sometimes on TV so and so is coming to Manila, bring all your sick friends and uh, loved ones, etc., etc. Because they can turn on and off God's power as they like. That's the bottom line. That's implied. Not said, but implied. How do you view them? Well, look at this verse. What is the outcome of a miracle? The first thing here is it reveals the glory of Jesus. One purpose of miracles is to point us to God. To see His glory and worship Him. So if somebody comes along and then makes you see, He seemingly can turn on and off the power of God. Who is spectacular? God or Him? In our human minds, it's always the man, not the God. Because God has become simply a tool for Him. Beloved, that's how you evaluate those who claim they can turn on and off the power of God like a faucet. And by this first sign, Jesus revealed 
His glory. The John 1.14 glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Full of grace and truth. What happened to the servants? The servants never came to trust in Christ. What does it tell you? Beloved, you could be in front of a miracle. You could be participating in it and still not believe in Jesus Christ. That's why you must not be carried away by those who say, when you see miracles, you must believe. Because miracles are not a guarantee of faith. It takes greater faith to just take God at His word, His completed word, and say, I read it. God said it. I believe it. That takes faith. The purpose of miracles is always for the glory of God. And miracles do not guarantee faith. The servants are evidence of that. And finally, one more purpose of miracles is that, like the disciples, we put our faith in Christ. We believe in Christ to the point of saving faith, and then we build our lives around Him. Remember, the purpose of the whole of John is John 20, 31. But these, the whole Gospel of John is written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life through His name. That's the purpose statement of the whole book of John. And that's the purpose of miracles. Believe in Christ. So this passage is all about Jesus. It's not about the way he spoke to Mary. It's not about the wine. It's not even about the miracle. It's about the fact that the disciples saw the glory of Christ and believed in him. And the challenge for you and me is to do the same. When you have your own time with God's word, to see Christ in his glory and to believe him more than you ever did. Through this first sign, we see a glimpse of Jesus. We are to realize how limited man is. What could the entire wedding organizers do? What could the mother of Jesus do? The limitations of man. The immensity of Christ. Creation of wine from water. The purposes of God. The purposes of miracles. That you and I might glorify God and put our faith. In him. That's what Martin Luther King is arguing for. He said, There is so much frustration in the world because we have relied on gods rather than God. We have genuflected, that means to kneel, before the God of science only to find out it has given us the atomic bomb, producing fears and anxieties that science can never mitigate. We have worshipped the God of pleasure only to discover that thrills play out and sensations are short-lived. We have bowed before the God of money only to learn there are such things as love and friendship that money cannot buy. That money is an uncertain deity. These transitory gods are not able to save or bring happiness to the human heart. Only God is able. It is faith in Him. That we must rediscover. You see, God can take a situation that looks hopeless. Hopeless. A wedding that runs out of wine. A life that has run out of joy. And then turn it around for His glory. Beloved, God can take something ordinary, something mundane, and turn it into something extraordinary. But it depends on whose hands. It is in. Somebody sent this to me and I thought it's a good way of ending this message. It goes like this. A basketball in my hands is worth around $40. A basketball in LeBron James' hands is worth $62 million. It depends on whose hands it's in. A tennis racket in my hands is useless. A tennis racket in Rafael Nadal's hands is multiple championships in Wimbledon, the U.S., and Australian Open. It depends on whose hands it's in. A rod in my hands will drive away a stray dog. A rod in Moses' hands will part the Red Sea. It depends on whose hands it's in. 
A slingshot in my hands is a toy. A slingshot in David's hand brings down Goliath. It depends on whose hands it's in. Five loaves and two fishes in my hands is a light lunch. Five loaves and two fishes in Jesus' hands will feed thousands upon thousands of people. It depends on whose hands it's in. Nails in my hands might produce a doghouse. Nails in Jesus' hands offer salvation for the world. It depends on whose hands it's in. So put your concerns, your worries, your relationships, your problems, your joys, your triumphs, your sorrows. Place them in Jesus' hands. Because it depends on whose hands it's in. When you let Jesus have his way in your life and surrender everything into his hands, beloved, you see the glory of God. Father, we thank you for these words captured for us in the Gospel of John. Enable us, Father, to see that they are not for the person beside us, they are for us personally, directly, individually. Whatever the need is of the people who are here today, I pray that Jesus will be seen as the only one who can meet those needs. Father, if there's anyone here today who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, let them come to Him today. Accept his work on the cross, that it is enough for our forgiveness from sin. And turn to him directly and find the forgiveness they're looking for. Or maybe there are Christians who have lost their joy of being believers, oh God. Something or someone drained them of that joy. Let them find it again. Let them come to Christ themselves directly personally Lord and then do what Mary said do whatever Jesus tells them to do even if it seems simple and unspectacular or ordinary let them do what Jesus asked them to do and today Lord as we participate in the communion you remind us again that this time the wine symbolizes the blood shed for our sins. That this is also a time of perhaps some confession, but a time of great celebration because Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we are saved by grace and grace alone. Enable us to appreciate this with gratitude and love, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the